the heart and soul behind every business. Stories. Welcome to Business Story of the Week, hosted by me, Joshua Lori. From setbacks to comebacks, from tragedies to triumphs, we inspire entrepreneurs through conversations that matter. Witness the magic that turns dreams into reality. Whether it's your career, business, or life, your success is always one story away. This is Business Story of the Week. Hey, this is Pandit Dasa, and you're watching Business Story of the Week. Fantastic. That is Pandit, our guest for today. And of course, my name is Joshua. I am your host for today and every other day and every other episode. Our question for today is, what can we learn from living with almost nothing? Well, Pandit is the perfect <laughs> Yes, to answer that question today, Pandit Dasa is a former monk turned keynote speaker who has inspired audiences at Fortune 500 companies and international government agencies. After a profound journey that began with his family's financial hardship and led him to spend 15 years in a New York City monastery, Pandit now shares insights on resilience, leadership, and work-life balance, and what a story, and quite interesting, and I'm very, very excited to talk about this one today, Pandit. Thank you for coming on the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great, and thank you for having me on the show and giving me an opportunity to share a little bit of my story. It's quite an interesting story, first and foremost, and I always, you know, it's, we love stories on here. It's literally the second name of the show, right? But Pandit, I always love starting, uh, starting everything, Origins. The origin story of Pandit Dasa. What was a young Pandit like? And of course, you know, it's a, it, there's you have stories about you in the monastery, uh, your your parents, you know, immigrants coming on here to uh, to the U.S. Lots of stories down there. What was a young Pandit like, and how did you end up in the monastery? For our audience and listeners to know. Well, the young pundit went through quite a few different transformations. The, the youngest pundit grew up, the first seven years of his life were in India, surrounded by family, friends, and an Indian culture. Mm -hmm. And so very happy, lucky, and just enjoying life. At the age of seven, my parents migrated to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And it was 1980. Basically, at that point, real growth began in one sense. Because I came to America, I didn't really speak English, very foreign mm -hmm. culture, didn't have any other relatives here other than my mom and dad, and I'm an only child. So mm -hmm. that did come with certain challenges of sort of feeling right. a little bit out of place, mm -hmm. um, not really connected with anything. So, you know, gradually, after working seven days a week, my parents established a multi-million dollar jewelry business in about an eight-year period. Wow. So we began living the American sort of dream much faster mm -hmm. than we expected to. Wow. And everything was great. They, they, they built a house on the hills of Los Angeles, pool, wow. jacuzzi, six bedrooms, like the whole shebang, you know, wow. everything you kind of hope for. And everything mm -hmm. was great for a while. Then in the early 1990s, my parents' jewelry business caught on fire, the building, the oh, uh, no. factory, and we ended up losing everything. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. And so... Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a big one to to digest. It's a big mm -hmm. one to digest. So suddenly, too. Yeah, I mean, I, it sound it, it was yeah, it, it was it happened. I mean, the fire happened, but it took about a year before the business completely collapsed because it just right. couldn't sustain okay. after that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then at that time, my parents decided to, or my dad decided to explore new business opportunities in post-communist Bulgaria. Wow. Okay. Wow. What a choice. What a yeah. choice there. But very interesting still. Like what happened there? It started looking for business opportunities there. Yeah. How did that come about? Well, so my dad had some contacts that said, hey, a lot of countries are breaking away from Russia and they're getting independence, but they don't have much. So it's a great opportunity to do some import export. And that was kind of his expertise. So he went out to Bulgaria for it. I don't know why that specific country, but that's some of his contacts said that would be a good place to go. And so he did. And, uh, you know, we left LA behind for good. And now I went from living in a six bedroom house on the hills of Los Angeles to a one bedroom Whoa. apartment in Bulgaria with my, and living there with my parents. And 
to give you an idea. Did, how quickly, how old were you then? How young were you then? 21. Okay. Wow. All right. Okay. So from a six bedroom house, loft, everything, beautiful Los Angeles to one bedroom apartment in Bulgaria at 21 years old. Wow. And, it. What was that? LA, in our LA home, when you were swimming in the pool, mm -hmm. you could see downtown LA. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like that's, that's so oh, man, what a life. People wow. Come to our area to check out mm -hmm. the view, you know? Wow. So, Bulgaria, 1992, 1993, it just came out of communism a year before. No one spoke English. Let's start right there. Mm. In a land where no one, you can't, uh -oh. no one, they just didn't teach it, right? So no one really spoke English. Maybe yes. one person out of every thousand spoke it. And, and even if they spoke it, they couldn't really follow the language. You know, you yes, still, of course. they just, they, they didn't really understand it. They might have studied from a book, but they can't have a conversation. Everything on TV was in Russian and Bulgarian, so I couldn't oh. understand TV either. There was course, no internet course. in those days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine it was a life, quite a, quite a life of isolation, mm -hmm. quite a bit of isolation, loneliness, confusion, right. introspection, uncertainty, because yes. the changes that I just went through economically, financially, socially, culturally, were massive. Of course. It's any it's enough to send, you know, send you in a tailspin. Absolutely. And uh, Absolutely. that's kind of what it was like for me. It was a very mm -hmm. challenging time. I really didn't know what was going to happen next. I didn't know if Bulgaria was my permanent destination. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't know what was happening. So at that time, I started practicing mindfulness because my parents had practiced meditation at home. So I saw that and I started practicing it there. And it really did help me kind of stay sane amongst all that change. Okay. okay. To speed it up, we moved back to the U.S. after a couple of years to the East mm. Coast, to New Jersey, because they wanted to be close to Manhattan. And then in 1999, I decided I'm going to take a break from life and take time out to figure myself out and how I want to live in the world. So I flew off to India to spend some time in a monastery in Mumbai. Right. 40 monks there. We all slept on a hardwood floor. No one had their own bed. No one had a room. No one had a mattress. You slept on a hardwood floor with a thin straw mat. I can see right, the look exactly. on your face. This is fascinating too. First, Because first of all, you went from losing everything to living in a, in, in a state of complete uncertainty and you know a lot of a lot of fear surrounding that but th that first stage of your life of losing everything was really involuntary right it was completely out of your control but now that you're yeah. back you know you were back you moved back you know you feel like it must have felt like you hope was back and you're you know like you're living your life again you voluntarily chose to lose everything again so that was that's yeah. the big question now. What was the decision of why going to and start living in a monastery? So even when we came back to the U.S., it wasn't like everything was back now. We weren't anywhere near the level we had, like nowhere near. We're kind of starting out yes. all over again. Mm -hmm. And so I think I became a little bit frustrated with the way life had been going and realizing how little control I had over life and such things in right. life. Because we like to think we have control, but I realize there is very control. It's like a big illusion to think that we have control. And yes. uh, so then I just, I realized that I needed to pause and think differently about life. Mm -hmm. uh, that it, something about life wasn't, make, wasn't making sense. I really did feel like Neo in the movie, The Matrix. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. Very fascinating. You know, so and so... Yeah, you so were trying to break free, you were trying to look at things life differently. Why the monastery? Well, monks have a different perspective on life. Mm -hmm. And I'd met some monks in New York and they had said, mm -hmm. Why don't you check that place out in India? It may be good for you to spend a little time right. there. And okay. I'm like, it wasn't an easy decision to walk yep. away and like of fly off to live in a monastery and sleep on a hardwood floor because you don't know what mm -hmm. you're walking into. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. India. It's not like I'm very comfortable in India either because I spent right, most of my course. time in the U.S. Uh -huh. And so ended up spending a total of six months in India in different monasteries in a few different right, places. Okay. 
-huh. After that, came back and moved into the monastery in New York City. Uh -huh. and, and ended up spending 15 years of my life as a monk in New York. That was it. So that was, it. So that, was that was the, the, the key key number of time there. You, you spent a few times in India and then back in New York another 15 years. Pandit, if you were to put it concisely, first of all, why did you why did you decide to do that again now that you're back in New York? And what do you take from that? 15 years. Would you say that, you know, looking back, would you have done it differently? That's really hard to say what somebody would do differently. But looking back, it was incredible. Um, wow. I hope I wouldn't do it differently. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's a great answer. That's a, that's a great, fantastic answer. Um, you know, Go ahead. No, I, I said, like, I really hope I would do the same, make the same right. choices. I do remember this one thing now that you're mentioning it. Please. I remember there was a chance where my, my, my parents were saying, hey, we know we really need your help with the business. And I was like, if I dive in here again, I could get sucked in. Mm -hmm. I'm like, because I was ready to go to a monastery. And like, hey, can you help us a little bit more? And I'm like, you know, if I keep saying yes and I don't do what I'm going to, that window may close and I may get sucked in and that opportunity may not show up again. I remember that I'm like, there's a window and I could see it, like almost see it closing. Wow, wow. So and it was a really, really powerful experience. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I've got to jump through and just mm -hmm. make this decision for better or for worse and mm -hmm. see what happens. Wow. And like you said, you wish you wouldn't do it differently and here you are today pondit you've taken these lessons and i understand that today your lessons from monkhood the resilience that you've gained from monkhood is the same resilience that you're teaching today in the corporate world talk to us a little bit about that and how does that how does that really translate we're talking about monkhood and then the corporate world the, how does that work well one thing i talk to people about see corporations are always going through major changes Right, of uh, leadership changes constantly. Mm -hmm. Right, technology changes constantly. Mm -hmm. There's mergers that happen that creates a major change, and most changes in corporate America cause a lot of anxiety and uncertainty because people aren't sure yes. if they're going to keep their job or not. Mm -hmm. So, I one thing that I talk about, I talk about several things. One thing I talk about the the change that I went through, mm -hmm. and I encourage like corporate audiences to have a positive approach towards change right. and not just be like, Oh my God, no. Like the more you do that, the worse you make it for yourself. Right. 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 So I'm like, look, there's a great quote from Steve jobs that I like to present, which is you can only connect the dots. When you look back at your life, you can't connect the dots when you look forward because there's nothing to connect. Interesting. Of course. And so, I asked them to connect the dots where mm -hmm. you see every difficulty that you went through and challenge that it definitely made us grow. Yes. And so yes. the change that's happening right now in your organization, and that's making you also make adjustments, they're going to make you stronger. You just have to be patient enough to see it through and let it give you the strength. But if, mm -hmm. if we just fight it and retaliate and just say, nah, I can't do it. Then it may not, may not, it may not make you uh, help you grow in the way that you could have. So that's one of the things that I right. talk about. Another thing, because I learned a lot about self care and taking care yes. of your well being and yes. your mental health. And mm -hmm. corporations struggle with this in a big way. People, so many people are st stressed out, burning out, and just retention levels are very unpredictable. The whole concept of quiet quitting is happening because people are getting burnt out in, in their yes. organizations. They don't know how to take a break. Yes. And so one of the other messages I really, uh, you know, talk about is self-care is not selfish. And that if we're only taking care of our physical health and ignoring our mental health, that's like taking your car to the car wash, but not to the mechanic. Wow. Of course. Of course. Because <laughs> the car accurate. wash will make your car look nice and shiny. Mm -hmm. So we can put on a nice set of clothes that are shiny and ironed and look good, but inside could be a complete mess. And if we're not taking care of our vehicle, especially with the mental, the inner portion, 
it's not going to get us to where we need to go. So that's another message that I talk about. Yes, of course, of course. That's very, very important too, because uh, these are these are very likely, you know, lessons that it feels like okay, we can apply this in our lives. You know, you know, self care. You know, um, thinking about uh, change, embracing change, so to speak. But it's just like wow, a monk teaching the corporate, you know, the corporate people, the corporate executives, companies. Um, Pandit, it's very interesting too because. Self-care isn't really quite apparent when it comes to what, like uh, the corporations that, you know, that especially when it comes to uh, how they treat employees, um, but it's changing now. But the corporate world, here's a question. If the corporate world were a monastery, Pandit, what would be the equivalent of, say, meditation? What would be the equivalent of self-care? In a corporation? In a corporate world. Mm -hmm. Well, I do encourage people to practice a little meditation. I, I help them understand yes. this is a science and research-based mm -hmm. practice. It's not a religious, spiritual thing. And of course, right I haven't been a monk now for 11 years. So I tell them, hey, mm -hmm. I'm not going to go into monk mode and teach you something spiritual now. <laughs> you know, I tell them, share with them some of the research that's already out there. And I, mm -hmm. and I have audiences close their eyes and do some breathing exercises right yes. there at the conference. And so they learn how to do it. And, I, and I, then I tell them, that, you know, you can do this between meetings, before meetings. If you think it's going to be a tough meeting or just if you're tired or not fully present, just take 10, take 10 deep breaths and then mm -hmm. go into that meeting. And if you're going to go into back-to-back -back meetings, make sure you have a minute or two to take some breaths. Mm -hmm. Come, you know, ground yourself, be present, be focused, be a little bit more relaxed through the breathing and then go into it. So this way, you're learning to do that for yourself throughout the day and not just like once a week or on the weekend. So I'm, I'm encouraging people, try to do mindfulness one or two minutes every hour or two at your work. That's take it. a minute mm -hmm. and take five breaths, 10 breaths. Like who can't do that? Like, That's hey, true. I'm sure we'll do this for 15 minutes every 30 minutes. <laughs> no problem right there. Right? Mm -hmm. So why not a minute of Why not a minute of that? Why not a minute of that? Even just for just a minute, you know you're doing it for yourself too. And the, exactly. the returns are just incredible, right? Just calming yourself down, with, whether in business or in life, it's important to just take a pause. And Pondit, I feel, I feel like you paused for many times in those 15 years in the monastery. <laughs> and now that you are in the corporate world, not in, living in a monastery, not a monk in, for 11 years now, you're now teaching uh, companies, you know, be resilient. Pandit, what would be the first, you know, how do you say this? What would be the first lesson that you'd say that you take from that monastery? And now that you are here as a, let's call it a, a civilian, so to speak, right? What would be now the biggest lesson that you take from that experience as you live your life outside of the monastery? Well, I try to remind myself of this one message I heard from another monk. Mm -hmm. He said, if you can control something, mm -hmm. like if you actually have control over something, then you have no right. reason to worry because you can control a situation. Uh, okay. And if you can't control something mm -hmm. and you know that you can't, then you have no reason to worry That's it. because it's out of your hand anyways. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's all of it. Wow, that is fascinating. I mean, it's a, it simplifies life down to a point where, hey, just so long as you're in control, is there's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to fear, so to speak. We fear mostly the unknown is the thing, but yeah, also we fear that you know, outcomes aren't going to be in our control. But it's fine, you know. It's I, I feel like we if we come to accept whatever the results are, not to be attached to that, especially in business too. Right in the corporate world, yeah. it's very, very common to to always yeah. be anxious and worry about a lot of things. But the, the story is very fascinating, and what you have shared with us today, and how you are uh, translating that into the corporate world, is very, very interesting. Pandit, um, of course, to, for our audience and listeners out there, the website is panditdasa.com. The monk, you know, the monk who turned to now the corporate world, teaching his lessons every day. Pandit, one last bit of wisdom that you would love to leave behind the audience, what would it be? 
take us home? Well, I think the last thing that I would say is that we all have to lead by example, mm -hmm. not just in terms of our work ethic, right. but in how we are taking care of our physical, mental, and emotional well-being. Wow. wow. Sometimes we think that we just need to be work hard, work hard, and we'd have to show everybody that how hard we're working. <laughs> Excuse me. Work hard. That leads to burnout too. It's always yeah. like work hard, work hard, so push, work hustle. Hard. But we have to lead by example, not just in terms of our work ethic and how hard we can work, but also in terms of how we're taking care of ourselves. Because that is the example we want to set for our family, for our colleagues, wow. for everyone. Wow, this person works hard, but look at how well they are, you know, how, how nicely they they're taking care of their physical, mental, and emotional well being. Because our other colleagues will see that, our family members will see that, and that is the example we want to set. Fantastic. Taking care of yourself, meditating, taking a, taking a breath, maybe running, maybe going for a walk. What else is there in your mind, Pondit? What do you usually do? Meditate and go for that's walks. It. That's and, it. and spend that's it. Friend, spend quality that's time right. with family and friends. That is like, I love that. Spend quality time with friends, maybe put that phone down while you're talking with your friends and families. Exactly. <laughs> talking to them. Very important. Pandit, thank you so much for this. This is like, um, I feel the, the peace. I feel the, 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 the relaxation. You know, the, 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 I feel like there is room for all of that in business and in life as well. Pandit, thank you so much for your wisdom. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Well, thank you very much, Asher, for having me on your show. I love being able to speak to you about these very important topics. It was an absolute pleasure. It was an absolute the pleasure is mine and for all our audience and listeners out there. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Once again, if you are interested, go check out PanditDasa.com. Very, very cool story. Go check that out. And if you want Pandit to join you, speak for your company, you know where to find him. Pandit, once again, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Take care. To all our audience and listeners out there, thank you for watching this episode. We will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. All right. Wow, Pandit, you were very um, serene through it all. I felt so relaxed just wanted to listen throughout <laughs> your story. Um, thank you so much for that. What did you think of the interview? I, I, I loved it. It was great. Short and sweet. Short and sweet, short and sweet. And I feel like we, we covered enough. You, you're, you're, your story was really, really, really cool. I found it very cool. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, do all, for those who want to learn more, they'll check it out. Uh, when, will, when will this go out? When will it be um, uploaded? The, my, the estimates are mid-September, mid to end of September, around that time, perhaps. Okay. So yeah, hopefully, if you, you would like to do it earlier, you let me know. We can probably expedite that. But also, no, no. you will... Okay. Mid-September, um, mid end of September is good. That's a good time. Also, people are back from vacation and stuff. Uh, all right, will you be able to put a link? to my website somewhere on oh absolutely we always okay. do that we'll make sure to do that absolutely and it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you you can find me everywhere by well going to google isaac mashman i cannot be in the personal branding space if i don't have the ability to say that and you're able to verify everything that i'm telling you is true so go to google search up isaac mashman connect with me on all of the platforms or one of the platforms and you can also go to mathman consulting group's website mathman cg Super simple. All right. So here's the thing. We try to get a little bit better every day, but we can't do it without you. So if you like the video, make sure to like and subscribe below. And if you have any comments, just leave them in the space under.